So today we have Dr. Joji Muramoto, and he's our organic agriculture specialist based out of the UC Santa Cruz campus. And Dr. Muramoto's research and extension focus is on organic production, soil health management, soil health, nitrogen management in organic systems, and soil-borne disease management in organic systems. And he um, runs a research and extension program that really covers um, the whole state or supports the whole state, um, but covers topics of wide interest. So thank you, Joji, for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Margaret, for the kind introduction. And uh, let me share my screen now. How does it look? It looks good. Looks good, and I can hear you well. So I think you're all set, Joji. Thank you. OK. Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, for lunchtime. And uh, um, thank you for coming. <clears throat> So today I'm going to talk about frontiers in plant nitrogen acquisition science, part one, non-traditional pathways and mechanisms. And uh, um, the, as Margaret said, this is two-part series. And the next week, uh, Dr. and uh, Dr. Wei Xin Chen, Professor Wei Xin Chen, at my campus, uh, my colleague at the UC Santa Cruz, is going to talk about uh, specifically on uh, rhizosphere priming effect. So. Um, that, that's going to be a very interesting, and so please don't miss uh, next week as well. So, um, okay, let's get started. <clears throat> um, this schematic figure shows nitrogen dynamics in organic systems. And uh, during this seminar series or past seminars, you might have learned how plant available nitrogen is provided to crops in organic systems. Organic growers apply cover crops, organic fertilizers, solid and liquid, and compost. And most of their nitrogen is in organic form. They become plant available in organic forms, such as ammonia and nitrate, through the uh, biological process called mineralization and nitrification. <clears throat> And the crop residues and soil organic matter also contain organic nitrogen, releasing inorganic nitrogen uh, via mineralization. Also, uh, the mineralization rate, uh, the speed of mineralization, uh, depends on materials C2N ratio and uh, environmental factors such as soil temperatures and moisture and management. And lastly, uh, legume cover crops provide plant available nitrogen to non legume crop plants uh, via nitrogen fixation by a symbiotic relationship with rhizobia bacteria. However, uh, recent uh, science shows that uh, there are some other uh, ways that crops can acquire nitrogen. So that's today's topic, and um, um, I'm going to talk about it. Two, two, two things today. <clears throat> First, plant nitrogen acquisition from any other pathways. And second, other factors that can affect nitrogen availability in the soil. For the first one, I'm going to talk about uh, first, direct uptake of organic nitrogen. And second, microbe-associated nitrogen acquisition. There are five different things I'm going to mention today. The first one is mycorrhizae, uh, fungi, and also dark septate, septate endophytic fun fungi, another fun fungus. And another interesting concept, uh, rhizosphasy, rhizosphasy cycle. <clears throat> and uh, another recent uh, kind of development in nitrogen fixation by iron reducing bacteria especially in paddy fields. <clears throat> and lastly, nitrogen fixation by non-nodulating endophytic bacteria. So, okay, let's get started. <clears throat> the first direct uptake of organic nitrogen. As I already mentioned, typically uh, crop plants absorbed plant available form inorganic nitrogen, ammonia or nitrate. 
However, uh, cumulative evidence shows plants can also absorb small to large organic nitrogen molecules. <clears throat> and this phenomena is much more common in Arctic and boreal forest, where ino less inorganic nitrogen is available. So plants in those area, due to the cold climate, um, microbial activity in the soil is very limited. So amount of inorganic nitrogen is very limited as well. The plants themselves are kind of adapted to absorb larger molecules, such as amino acid peptides and proteins, as is. However, uh, we have a lot of qualitative evidence, but uh, how in actually quantitative contribution to overall nitrogen uptake is still unknown. It's a very difficult study. Um, you have to use a lot of isotopes and uh, it's very difficult. So the science is not there yet. <clears throat> Also, um, when in the field condition in the soil, microbes actually uh, help absorb different kinds of nitrogen. <clears throat> the first example is mycorrhiza, mycorrhizal symbiosis. And uh, as, as you know, mycorrhizal, my, uh, Arbuscular mycorrhizae, in short AM, uh, present 92% of plant families and uh, can extend root zones of plants and protect plants from pathogens, also protect plants from extreme environment by extending roots area, and also assist communication between plants. Plants communicate each other through uh, mycorrhizal, um, you know, uh, colonization. That's very interesting fun fact. <clears throat> but the, today's focus is nitrogen, and the study shows on California farms with healthy soils. Uh, Arbuscular mycorrhizae can increase crop nitrogen uptake, including nitrate, and can uh, also AM can reduce nitrate leaching, and also reduce nitrous oxide uh, emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions, we can re reduce it. <clears throat> However, again, um, relative nitrogen contribution rate to overall nitrogen budget is still unknown. It's difficult to study. Just so you know, <clears throat> fossil, uh, fossil record shows that this symbiosis between plants and mycorrhizae have been ongoing at least five, five, 400 million years. It's a very long time, but we just started to understand what they're doing. That's, that's our knowledge. We still lots of unknowns. The second example of microbe associated nitrogen acquisition is by dark septate endophytic fungus. Uh, it's called DSE in short. Uh, this fungi can increase nitrogen uptake in non mycorrhizal plants. Uh, mycorrhizal, as I said, 92% uh, of plant families can be uh, you know, colonized, but uh, plants of species such as brass casey, brassica plants, it's not mycorrhizal, but this dark septate endophyte can uh, colonize those brassica plants too. Um, and then it can absorb organic nitrogen in soil and provide it to the host plant. This uh, figure shows the uh, uh, their, one of the data uh, from left non-nitrogen and nitrate ammonia and different kinds, five different kinds of uh, amino acids were provided. And HE is inoculation, inoculated plants. And uh, this is Chinese cabbage, so it's brassica, non mycorrhizal plants. And the control is non inoculation. So, uh, black bar shows the uh, uh, dry weight of inoculated plants. So, nitrate, ammonia, uh, and especially uh, amino acid, different amino acids, uh, like uh, left four, four left amino acid, especially increase the uh, um, plant dry weight by inoculation, <clears throat> showing the evidence of uh, amino acid absorption by uh, facilitated by this uh, fungus colonization. 
And uh, this fungi, uh, by colonizing and providing nitrogen, but uh, receive carbon from the host plant. It's kind of, you know, give and take relationship. Another interesting phenomena, uh, it's called a uh, rhizophagy cycle. <clears throat> um, the plant absorb bacteria at the plant uh, itself and the suck up nutrients from bacteria uh, and release a uh, dead uh, microbes. And microbes, you know, actually uh, recharge it and come back to plant roots. So it's called, it's a very interesting um, phenomena. Uh, it's called rhizophagy cycle. <clears throat> Go into the plants, come out from root here, and recharge it and come back to plants. So it's been observed um, microscopically. And then uh, I learned from this phenomena from um, my friend and a retired organic farmer, Tom Willy. So thanks to Tom. Um, but again, um, precisely what nutrients are transferred through rhizophagy or how important this process is for nutrient acquisition is still unknown. <clears throat> Another recent development um, I learned this recently is nitrogen fixation by iron-reducing bacteria. Uh, it's called Geobacter and um, Anero-Mixobacter. <clears throat> Those uh, specific bacteria was found in paddy fields in Japan uh, in 2017. And it's very uh, ubiquitous in paddy field. And uh, it's, it's, it's now, nobody has found, they, they, everybody thought this just, you know, um, iron reducing bacteria, but without noticing, they also fix nitrogen. And uh, they live uh, under anaerobic conditions. And then uh, the researcher um, who discovered this bacteria did some experiment by just adding iron to paddy field. They actually activate nitrogen fixation capacity of the bacteria and added more nitrogen and increased rice yield. So this is some picture uh, of the field trials done in China, actually. And left side had much greener uh, rice, uh, which is the iron application uh, and the control right side. <clears throat> and uh, lastly, uh, of the microbe associated nitrogen acquisition, nitrogen fixation by known nodulating endophytic bacteria. Endophytic means, you know, live inside the plants. So bacteria in the plants. And this is very interesting too. <clears throat> I didn't know about it uh, until recently. It's called glucono, uh, glucon acetobacter diano, uh, diazotrophicus. That's kind of a mouthful. But uh, <clears throat> it was discovered in sugarcane stems and roots in Brazil where sugarcane had been produced with little use of nitrogen fertilizers without yield loss. Uh, it was first reported 1988. So it's 40 years or so, uh, 30 plus years old discovery. And then a study shows the up to 80% of nitrogen in a sugarcane was biologically fixed through this uh, bacteria. Some nice picture. This is actually in, in maize, uh, corn. So as I'm gonna talk about it in a minute, but uh, it, this bacteria can be hosted by many other crops. This is an example of uh, corn. Root tips, are so dark, uh, like a black dot, are actual bacteria. And the E is uh, an inoculated control. So in the roots, cell walls and leaves and many places. And the interesting uh, things is that this bacteria can be hosted by um, many plant species, uh, mango, beet, carrot, oil palm, radish, pineapple, forage, cactus, corn, sweet potato, cassava, banana, guava, cereal and grasses, coffee, tomato, tea, and lettuce. And uh, another interesting uh, character of this bacteria is the uh, even under high nitrogen condition, that doesn't um, reduce the 
efficacy of nitrogen fixation. Unlike, you know, um, rhizo, rhizobacter uh, of the uh, legume plants, those uh, bacteria, uh, symbiotic bacteria in legumes, usually reduce their nitrogen fixation under high nitrogen fertility conditions. But that's not the case for this one. So some example, uh, spring wheat, uh, different nitrogen application rate on x-axis, uh, regardless nitrogen application rate, uh, and fix is the uh, inoculated uh, plots has higher yield than control without uh, inoculation. And the right side figure is about lettuce. This is hydroponic, so hasn't done in, in the soil yet, but uh, regardless of nitrogen application rate, uh, inoculation seems to help uh, increase the dry matter. So that's kind of interesting. And then this inoculant uh, are uh, commercially available. So this might be interesting to try for different crops in California in the future. <clears throat> okay, the second part is talk about the other factors that can, that can affect nitrogen availability in the soil. First one is the effect of plant roots exudate on nitrogen acquisition. So it's called rhizosphere priming effect. Uh, Wei Xin is gonna talk about this specifically next week. So I'm gonna go over very quickly. And the second one is tightly coupled plant soil nitrogen cycling. Uh, it's a uh, good, very good observations in organic farms. And third one, uh, effect of crop rotation on soil nitrogen internal cycling. And lastly, effect of soil health on soil nitrogen availability. <clears throat> okay, the first one, rise of fair priming effect. Uh, it is known that the plants release up to 40% of photosynthesized carbon from roots as exudates. It varies a lot, you know, depends on species and, you know, growth stage and many factors, but up to 40% releasing from the roots, what they're doing, right? They're trying to feed the microbes, run roots, trying to make a, a you know favorable condition for th themselves. And the rhizosphere priming effect is defined that, that this, the stimulation or suppression of soil organic matter decomposition by uh, living roots and associated rhizosphere organisms when compared to soil organic matter decomposition from rootless soils under the same environmental conditions. So exudation from roots, lots of labor by carbon, uh, can affect uh, microbes around the roots, and which can stimulate uh, soil organic matter decomposition around root zone, and then pro can provide more uh, nitrogen for plants um, by you know this effect, <clears throat> and then. But this is very difficult to study. You have to use a lot of isotopes, carbon isotope and oxygen isotopes and so forth. And then Wei Xin is the, the specialist of doing isotope study. So that's why he's doing this kind of a study and known uh, one of the pioneers of this field. And, uh, but it, it is known to, to be very highly variable. Uh, for carbon, this priming effect can be negative 50% to positive 350%. Uh, I don't know what it means. So let's ask Wei next, next week. And then for nitrogen, uh, 32 to 52% positive for soybean and sunflower. <clears throat> so the effect uh, depend on climate, plant, and soil <clears throat> conditions. And then it's very difficult to do this kind of study in the field. So um, the most of the studies been done in using pot, pot environment. And uh, so in the, in the pot environment, you know, root uh, density may be higher than field. So there might be some artifact in there as well. One of the study using UCSC organic farm soil <coughs> in the pot study uh, using different crops, broccoli, lettuce, spinach, maize, uh, and the sunflower, uh, trying to evaluate the uh, rhizosphere primary effect with um, without fertilizers. <coughs> and um, with fertilizers, broccoli, lettuce, spinach had 
pretty high, 50 to 60% uh, priming effect. I mean, provide more nitrogen than uh, just mineralization from uh, soil organic matter or organic fertilizers. But uh, that's not the case for maize and sunflower. So crop dependent. And it, it's interesting to see, you know, fertilizer conditions um, had more uh, rise of primary effect, probably reduce more exudate. I don't know. Let's ask, let's ask Weishin next week. <clears throat> Another example, it's a very interesting example, uh, is tightly coupled plant soil nitrogen cycling. Um, this is what was done by Tim Bowles, uh, currently uh, agroecology professor at UC Berkeley. But this is his uh, PhD thesis work. His team uh, surveyed 13 organic uh, Roma type tomato processing tomato fields on uh, similar soil types in Yoro County and found three patterns of nitrogen cyclings. Judge, First, really quick, sorry. Uh, looks like the Spanish uh, translation, they're having an issue. Um, if you don't mind, can we just take a couple of minutes to figure it out and then we can move forward again? Okay, let's take a break. Yeah. Lupita, can you um, speak and I'll go into the interpretation room to see if I can hear you or not. Go ahead and say something, Lupita. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, no, no. So I'm in the Spanish room right now and I can hear you fine. Thank you. We're good, Joji. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> so the, the another example is Tetri coupled plant soil nitrogen cycling. And uh, Tim Bold surveyed 13 um, processing tomato fields in Yoro County with similar soil types. And they found three patterns of nitrogen cyclings. Uh, group one is um, relatively low uh, nitrogen in the soil in all plant growth st stages. And then um, plant nitrogen is low too, and the yield, low yield. It's basically nitrogen deficient. And the second group has lots of nitrogen, nitrate uh, in the soil. And uh, um, above so-called threshold, uh, organic process symptomatous threshold. And then it has a much higher yield and high nitrogen content in plants. And the third gr group, however, showed really low um, soil nitrogen, but high plant nitrogen percent and uh, similar or even higher yield than a second group. So what's going on? The first one is nitrogen deficient, low yield, low soil nitrate pool. The second one, nitrogen surplus, again, uh, high yield, high soil nitrate pool. And th third one, they call it titrate coupled nitrogen cycling. High, ye high yield, but low, so low soil nitrate pool. What he found is that those uh, titrate coupled nitrogen cycling farms has very really efficient nitrogen management and high soil, soil microbial activities and uh, <clears throat> high available soil carbon and, and rapid plant nitrogen uptake. So because microbial activity is very high in the soil and um, <clears throat> plants are, plant, uh, microbes turn over very fast. So even though nitrate pool measured was low, but uh, nitrogen flow or flux were high, which provides enough nitrogen to crop. I think it's very, very important um, findings. <clears throat> and another one is called, um, another one um, kind of management effect is the effect of crop rotation on internal nitrogen cycling. Long-term crop complexity experiments in Nebraska are comparing monocultural corn, corn soybean rotation, and corn soybean sorghum oat clover mixture rotation 
with and without nitrogen fertilization. Uh, and then found the more complex the crop rotation, the faster the release of soil organic matter nitrogen. And probably due to uh, release more um, free amino acid and then uh, more uh, microbiomass, micro, uh, biomass nitrogen, and, and provide more plant, plant available nitrogen. <clears throat> and then complex rotation provided more crop residues with lower CN ratios, and that could be a part of it. And however, nitrogen fertilization, actually, if you apply more nitrogen, it suppresses some of the benefits of temporal uh, crop diversification. That's a caveat. And lastly, uh, effect of soil health on soil ni nitrogen availability. Uh, health of soil can affect uh, nitrogen availability. Basically, healthy soil can provide many ways to provide nitrogen to plant, not just fertilizer and soil uh, organic fertilizer mineralization. Uh, for example, uh, in health, under healthy soil, roots aggregate actually um, stimulate the uh, oxygen production by microbes around the roots. And that oxygen production uh, benefits the fine roots development of the plants. And uh, another way is roots aggregate um, increase the microbial activity around the roots. And then um, that helps uh, uh, mineral associated organic nitrogen release. And another one is protists and nematodes in the soil feed on microbes and release nitrogen and fine root grows into aggregates and open microsites and uh, access uh, available nitrogen in there and mycorrhizae penetrate uh, aggregate access uh, occluded pockets of nitrogen. So like, you know, in this picture, it shows, you know, multiple pipes are available. Even if one pipe is closed, you can provide with another uh, pipes mm, through uh, of nitrogen. So it makes the system more resilient. And the multiple pathways for plants to access nitrogen provide more resilient nitrogen supply under variable conditions. So I showed the uh, uh, selected references here. So, um, not all of them, but uh, if you have any question, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.